So this is lecture number three. It is on the changing face of business given technology and some of the internet issues and some of the things that is a technology. It's really more of a technology management for engineering kind of lecture. So um, there's a little bit of an overlap between some of the other but everything gets com comes together. In fact, when I say there's a little bit of overlap, we're going to cover actually Porter's five forces model. Again, today from a different perspective, we've seen this model. We saw it in the last lecture, but that was two weeks ago. And most people don't remember anything anyway. So um, just uh, so you know. And then we also have a comparing and contrasting Porter's three generic strategies, looking at top line versus bottom line the run growth transform framework as well as developing business strategies as a uh, engineering manager so I'm sure that something in here will be new to somebody um, and it will also be a nice business overview as well for innovation management so um, describing the role of the value chain as well and getting really into the concept of the value chain um, and the analysis of identifying the value and basically uh, things of that nature. So the overall theme of technology today has to do with the internet and everyone's sort of identity theft and everyone's sort of the price to pay for illegal everything on the internet. And uh, so as, as the kind of the slide portrays here, is your social security number worth $98? Probably not now anyway. It depends on how much value there is to that piece of information actually. So you used to, okay so the, you don't need to know this, but the cost of social security numbers have gone down throughout the years. <laughs> They're becoming cheaper and cheaper every day. Why is that? Because people are hiding information about themselves, and technology isn't um, allowing us to, um, hopefully, it's going to continue this trend, but it's not allowing us to access that much information, even if you have a social security number, which is a nice thing. So information technology has greatly accelerated the good and the bad in, uh, in business, and also increased profit, reduced costs, increased service quality, benefit society. And for most part, social media has definitely benefited society from a technology perspective. But it can also be used to steal your personal information, commit fraudulent acts, and do a bunch of illegal stuff. And many sites on the web are right now selling your personal information for you. Uh, you know this when you receive unsolicited emails. Um, where did that email come from? Well, where did you get where did the address come from? Um, well, it came from somebody who used it. So the government has actually implemented a bunch of laws actually to protect you as a citizen. However, not everybody follows the laws. So the internet is probably one of those places that um, thinks it's exempt, or people on the internet think they're exempt to laws. So what is your personal information actually worth? Here's some dollar values. These dollar values are about a year old, I'd say. So you pay, pay about $490 for a credit card number and a PIN perhaps. Maybe $147 for a driver's license. All this stuff is for sale, by the way, on the internet. This is not a joke. So, <laughs> a $6. Only 6 bucks for a PayPal login and password. That's not buying you very much. Uh, your social security number is really only worth less than $50 right now, actually. So it's not even more than $98. Uh, $294, $78 amount, billing data, include account number, stuff like that. So, did I tell you this story about Google Voice? I don't think I did this. It was appropriate, actually. Uh, there was a thing on, uh, I think it was CBS, actually, about maybe a year ago, about voice over IP. Um, it was like one of these little news segments, middle of the day, technology report, whatever. And uh, it was timing how long it took for your personal information to be stolen over a Google voice call. And I believe, if I remember the number correctly, it was seven point something minutes. It was in the seven minute range. So what they did is they set up a bunch of people and they went and they called and they paid bills over the phone and they used a Google Voice, Voice over IP telephone line. And then every single one, 100% of the calls ended up getting the information stolen in one form or another. You know, you call up and say, hey, I want to pay my, my phone bill or my Verizon bill. Okay, what's your credit card number? What's your PIN? You, know, the, you give all of the information over the phone over a Voice over IP call. And the, 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 uh, the segment was actually to kind of highlight the security issues of voice over IP and why people shouldn't be using it for business purposes. And by the way, it's still a problem, so don't ever pay a bill using voice over IP because it takes seven point something minutes for that information to be stolen and used somewhere else. So anyway, so 100% of all of the information was stolen from each one of the calls. And the calls were done over about an hour period of time and the average took seven point something minutes before the card was used 
So it takes about seven minutes. So if, you, if you're willing to risk that, then uh, do it. If not, don't pay any bills over voice over IP. So some people mm -hmm. in the class probably have used voice over IP probably with Skype. That's safe. Just don't give out any personal information. Social security numbers, credit card numbers, don't give out any data because all that stuff's recorded. It's not only recorded, but it's going over IP. It's going over the internet. There's tons of little programs on the internet, you know, like for sniffers, for crawlers, for all sorts of different technologies to mine data. They're just looking for this stuff. So don't hand it to them. <laughs> so, which is what you're doing with Google Voice. Uh, it's not just Google Voice. I'm just saying that because that's the example that was used on the segment. Um, and anything like uh, Vonage, anything voice over IP, Vonage, Skype, Google Voice, um, all of those voice over IP services. So they're not the safest as you'd think. So some good questions you might have is, uh, you know, everyone at this point probably has a friend or somebody who was a victim of identity theft of some sort. It's kind of common these days. It's kind of the expected. Uh, how often do you buy your credit report? Eh, kind of looking at that. Not to scare you. Did you... Uh, do you know you get one for free annually? That's actually still true. You still get one for free. Every one of the credit card companies, all three of them, will give you one for free. You just have to call them up and ask for it. So don't pay for one online. And is technology good or bad? Well, that's another question as well. So you live in the digital age, and average American relies on more than 250 computers per day in terms of their job or in terms of their life. Uh, according to Time Magazine, 14% of cell phone users stop, well, stop having sex to have a phone call. Uh, 50, to, 50 of the 206 Fortune 500 companies were IT companies. So, Definitely technology has taken over for the most part um, in the perspective. So. so we don't need that slide either. So let's go to this one here. So with the topic of this lecture and today's kind of theme, because each day has a different theme to it, is the business of technology and how businesses should use technology and as an IT manager or as an engineering manager or any type of manager actually in the organization, engineering managers generally fall into the IT or into the engine, some, some sort of technology related field and uh, the business must drive the technology and the important thing to remember from this is it's not the other way around. Technology doesn't drive the business. If your technology is driving the business, then you're not doing your job correctly as a manager. Um, so we have industry pressures and uh, competition. We have key business strategies and we have important business processes to consider. And then these are the key technologies to support those processes. So what you're supposed to be doing is coming up with support for the business tasks, the business processes, using technology and not keeping the technology um, as the driving factor. So you assess the state of the competition in the industry and the pressures affecting your organization. You determine the business strategy to address the comp competition and the industry pressures. And you identify the business processes to support the chosen business strategy. So what you do, a lot of engineering management, and actually, I shouldn't say just engineering management, a lot of management in general is all strategy driven. Um, if you're not a good strategist, you don't like strategies, you don't like thinking about big pictures and goals and planning ahead, don't become a manager. Because <laughs> you're not going to do well. Uh, because that's essentially, depending upon what you're doing as a manager, if you're actually doing a management job, you're not doing any work, well, any physical work or mental work. You're doing a lot of strategic work is what you're doing. So you want to align technology tools with those business processes as well. So never do this in reverse, as the slide says on the bottom. So you don't buy the technology and see how it's going to work for you. You see what's working for you and what's not working for you, and you buy the technology to improve that. And you use the technology to mimic or to, hello, to improve the business process. It's not the other way around, which is kind of interesting because consumers generally do things the other way around. You can tell when you do it the other way around when you buy a product and you have no use for it. And you're wondering, well, why did you? In fact, that's what happened with the original iPads that came out. A lot of people bought iPad. What do you do with an iPad? Trying to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> I said, well, why did you buy it? Well, because it's an iPad. And then you figure out what to do with it, which is actually kind of interesting because some industries have consumers working the opposite direction, and it works. Like if there's a new product, everyone will buy it. 
You know, like when the first iPhone came out, the first smartphone came out, people didn't say, well, do I need a smartphone? They don't even know what it did. Then they buy them. So, so consumers work in the reverse, but businesses should work the opposite way around. They should only buy the technology if they know what to do with it and to help it improve the business process, because it is all about the business process. So, so I gave you uh, some information earlier in the course on management information systems, or MIS, which is the planning for the development management and the use of IT tools. This is a good definition for you for information systems as it fits in with management. To perform all tasks related to information processing and management, three key resources in MIS, information, the people, and the information technology. Information technology comes in all different shapes and sizes. It's not just the Internet. But here's the big, here's the big, uh, the big concept to think about. Information resources, not information technology, not information systems. It's actually a separate category in itself as a... Any type of manager, but especially technology-oriented manager or engineering manager working in that, you're looking at the resources. And everything is information-oriented. So information is a huge word to kind of think about. Uh, we have intellectual asset hierarchy of data, information, and then we have business intelligence. And then we have knowledge that goes along with that. Um, so the raw facts and figures is just the data. The data is, describes the particular phenomena, such as the occurring a temperature, price of movie rental. Well, so think of a data as a number, calculated cost of something. And then the information that's about it, which is the data that you know uh, is used to apply meaning to something, to have a specific meaning. So as an information resource, the data of the company is the resource. It has nothing to do with technology. It's the information learned from the data. So as an information resource, we've got some information here, the average age, youngest age, oldest age, let's say if we're looking at age analysis uh, to keep track of, so information uh, as aggregated data giving meaning to what is our demographic, what do our, what do our consumers look like, or excuse me, what do our customers look like in this particular case. So you can find age-related data here. So data that becomes information, here's some information here, um, or some data, just like a, a number, and then, you know, what it was that maybe the date an employee was born, how soon will the employee retire, and these are all, this is all with the information that gets out of that particular number, um, and the impact on the, if, if he or she does retire, and convincing her not to retire, and all of the different things about retirement. If you're an HR manager, you might be interested in looking at the, the date as a, as a particular piece of raw fact that turns into information as you go through the process. As a technology-oriented person outside of maybe HR and marketing, even marketing sales departments more interested in this, but if you're, if you're managing the technology, you're more interested in the business intelligence. Because the business intelligence is the collection about, well, who are our customers, who are our competitors, who are our business partners in our competitive environment, who are we actually working with, which is kind of an interesting question because if you go out like you know person on the street and you ask people questions in companies, half the people have no idea. <laughs> they're isolated in their own little job of what they're doing. And who are your competitors? I don't know. <laughs> Guy down the street, I don't know. They don't know who the compet. They don't even know who. And then if you're the manager in this department, you're you're really in sad shape if you don't know who you're competing with. So maybe I should ask the people at IT, who are we competing with? <laughs> no, I, sh I should promise I not to talk about IT. Well, that would be other universities, right? Private universities, public universities? I'd say private universities. So there's no competition for us. We're middle-tiered. Well, we're not Ivy League. We're a lot cheaper than, like, Santa Clara University or Stanford. We're the only, probably one of the only private universities I want to say in San Jose, but I'm not even sure about that. So I guess I'm a bad person to ask. <laughs> I'm as bad as the people on the street. I have no idea who are, but I don't work in that capacity. That's my excuse. So the only upper division. We have the only upper division. We are the only graduate school, I think. We are the only graduate school in Santa Clara County. Yeah. I think we're the only one who will be offering uh, something about an MBA or something. No, doctorate in business administration in the state of California, I believe. Yeah. So we are quite of a unique school, so we should be capitalizing on that as a strategic advantage for our competition. 
So business intelligence is information on steroids. It's knowing what your competitive advantage is going to be and then using it with technology or using it with the environment. So business intelligence can help you make important strategic decisions if you do it correctly. So here's another kind of filled in chart here on the information resources, the total sales for all customers on plan B as an example versus the average age of a customer uh, preferring salesperson S3. Uh, so it's a little bit of analysis. It just don't, it doesn't, this is, I think this is an example of a retail sales kind of environment, but um, I'm combining, oh, here it is. It's customer salespeople and purchases in this particular case. But uh, think of this as an example of calculating and monitoring and actually accounting for the business intelligence in the form of, and creation of this information resource. Which is kind of interesting because information resources are all about um, creating knowledge for the organization. I mean, how does Apple know what consumers like? How does uh, Microsoft know what they want to make in Windows 8? They're basing it off of information and knowledge that they've gained through responding to consumer complaints, probably <laughs> consumer consumer issues. I don't know, consumer requests, maybe. Or maybe they have a totally separate, you know, mirror ball or, excuse me, uh, I think it is a mirror ball. They look into the ball, those magic balls or whatever you see, the fortune balls, you know. So knowledge. Knowledge is the broad term that can describe many things. It's a contextual explanation of business intelligence, so actions to take to affect the business intelligence. Intellectual assets such as patents and trademarks or knowledge. Uh, knowledge is know-how or things such as the best practices on certain things. So certain companies, and I, I, I don't like to call it business knowledge. Instead, I call it um, the, um, let's see, now that, now that allergy stuff's kicking in, I'm like, what's the word for it now? <laughs> core competencies is what I'm trying to think of right now. Uh, so it's a little delayed. Uh, core competencies. Uh, which is what you have if you have the business knowledge, you have the competency to know what consumer, what color to make something, or what time of year to produce a product or something. <clears throat> so information resources also have quality attributes associated with them, timeliness as well. It makes no sense to know this knowledge too late in the game to figure something else. Uh, when you need it, describing the right time period as well. The location, no matter where you are. Actually, knowledge has location associated with it. It also has a form, audio, text, animation, or credibility and validity associated with it. And the lack of any of the above can create a geico garbage in, garbage out. Everyone is probably familiar with that term from the early 80s or so. And computer, computer people misuse garbage in, garbage out, and user friendliness. The two things I remember from that. Okay, so information resources in terms of the organizational perspective. And this is how you fall in in terms of management. So we have the current state of the organization that has ups and downs associated with it. So we have stra strategies, goals, and directives that produce the up and down cycle of the events that occur that are associated with the organizational strategy. We have the information granularity that goes up and down. Then in terms of how much detail is associated with it. So we have coarse granularity versus fine granularity. And we also have customer suppliers and other partners that are going in and out of the organization. And then we have between the functional business units and work teams, we have communication and collaboration that is also forming part of the strategy that's associated with this perspective. So you think of this as, um, think of the slide here as, as a combination of all of the um, pieces of the puzzle that need to be considered. Um, you can't actually just look at, for example, um, you know, the information granularity and focus on that completely and not worry about what the customers are saying or not worry about um, what the departments are sharing. So. so this is the flow of the information as well. This pyramid is a hierarchy with management levels as well. It's not written on the slide here, but we have um, higher strategic management down to lower tactical or operational management as well in this pyramid, so, which is kind of interesting. So, so information flows of information, we have upward, downward, horizontal, inward, and outward. So upward is describing the state of the organization based on transactions. So we're growing upward, if you want to think of it that way, based on our transactions, our sales, 
our number of service accounts we've had, um, the number of people who have um, been satisfied with the product. Downward are strategies, goals, and directives that originate at higher levels and passed to lower levels. If the company has an initiative, like a green initiative or something, that would be a downward uh, flow of information. Or somebody high up in the organization, the CEO, CIO, says, hey, we're a green company. And then everybody else below them kind of trickles down, and they go and all the way down to the person who is um, deciding not to print something out or, I don't know, deciding to put something else in and not use as much natural resources or whatever green actually means. Because green's been changing definition. So, <laughs> um, Versus an upward motion where if you do well on the sales force, upper management gives you a promotion, you know, or you're, you're coming from the bottom end, from the tactical worker up to the strategic level, from an upward position. Horizontals between functional units and work teams. So the management of the information flow between R&D and sales, R&D and marketing, and the horizontal flow of the information. And then the outward inward, so from the customers to the suppliers to the distributors to the other partners who are flowing through hands. Why do you care about any of this stuff? It's your information resources, the flow of the information. If you don't know where the information is coming from, you don't know where to put the bucket to collect it. Um, or you may not necessarily know what's happening in the organization. Um, there's a lot of, um, especially technology managers and engineering managers who are um, in a back building somewhere <laughs> behind a closed door. They have no idea what's going on, but they're like managing the technology of the organization and uh, they have no idea, they have no clue what's happening. You know, so it's more than are we making a profit or are we making a loss. It's more like what's going on in terms of the information flow and where the information is coming from which is kind of key. So what does it describe? Internal, external, objective, and subjective information that can be taken into consideration. The internal, this is again more vocabulary for you. So strategic operational aspect. External is the environment. Objective is quantifiable. Describe something that is known. Subjective attempts to describe something that is unknown. Subjective. So, so people resources. Most people, as soon as you slap a management title on you, say, oh, you're managing people. <laughs> Which is actually kind of funny, because technology managers still have to manage some people, but not a lot of people. But you still have to have people skills, which is kind of interesting. So people are the most important resource in an organization. If it weren't for the people, there wouldn't be an organization. Uh, technology literacy is important, information literacy, and then ethical responsibility is also important in terms of quality. So as a people resource, technology literate knowledge workers know how and when to apply technology, which is kind of interesting. They know how to make the computer work for them, or they know what programs to use, or they know, you know what resources and where the information flow is. And then we have information literate worker. So the technology literate worker is kind of a no-brainer. You send someone to a computer class, or you train your staff. So you're working uh, and you've got, let's say you're managing a technical support department or you're managing a research department or something. Not that that's anything in common between the two, but there's a lot in common when it comes to the people. Making sure that the people have the right knowledge of the right tools that are available to them and they actually know how to use the tools. It's not a matter of hiring competent people, unfortunately. Unfortunately, what you get are a lot of people that have really nice resumes. And then when you hire them and you're the engineering manager who's putting together this team, you go, oh my god, you, I can't believe you've ever studied that when they have a degree in it. And you say, well, where did you come from? <clears throat> anyway, so assuming that they don't have anything that's written on their resume, you have to figure out how to get them the right resources. So they need to be technology literate in order to make the right decisions. They also need to be information literate. As a knowledge worker, this you don't get. So... This is combined, you can, you can define the information needs and then create it. So how, knowing how and where to obtain the information and understand the information and then act appropriately based on information. You know you have this when you have an employee who is able to think for themselves. So they're trying to make a decision on a packaging of something and they're looking at the different options and they actually know the correct option because, and they're actually making good decisions because they're taking into consideration the information 
that's available to them as a resource. So they've looked at customer information. They looked at well, where are these products going to? And you know, where it, it is an example. And this is a this is kind of a this is kind of a good engineering kind of example. Products now don't aren't shipped with multiple layers of packaging. <laughs> They're shipped in the box. With this. And so we don't make packaging anymore for a retail store. We make packaging for shipping. So the quality of the pack, unless you're Apple and you're making it the old, you're, you're on a different route. But uh, you know, I've noticed Microsoft is following Apple's different route, which is stupid. They should just put it in a brown paper box and ship it off the door. But we don't need packaging anymore, so why waste money on that? Anyway, so long story short, the person who knows uh, what the consumer wants and values is not going to spend so much money on that packaging, depending upon the product depending on what kind of product it is. If it's um, a clothing item, you're going to put a lot of money on the tag. And then why is that? Well, because, because the, the item gives them a higher quality to it. If you've actually, actually, next time you go shopping, go into a, like, a, like a true religion store. Those tags are like practically made out of leather. Those are really good tags. And then I go into a Gap, and they don't even have tags. <laughs> or not a Gap. Um, I don't mean to criticize stores. I'm going to um, a Target, and you barely get a tag. You get a barcode that's printed on a box or something. You don't even get a tag on it. Um, so, because uh, as an information resource, the consumer perspective of the product, if you've studied, uh, mar I'm not a marketing person either, I just know little tidbits, but if you've studied consumer behavior and marketing patterns, the tag is like probably the most important item in the purchase. It's, it has nothing to do with the product. According to some people, I don't know. Well, it's like, why does Apple spend more money on the packaging of their iPads and iPhones and things than they do on the earbuds? <laughs> the packaging costs more than that, and, and the box is never going to fade. I mean, it's a nice white box, with a nice detailed, shiny color on top of it. It's 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 a good package. All right, so expropriately based on the information. So if you are information literate, you know those things. And that's just an example using packaging that applies to everything. Ethics, mm -hmm. principles and standards that guides people's behavior towards other people, also a factor. There's some ethical issues here. You want to be in the legal ethical quadrant. What you end up getting is illegal, ethical, unethical, illegal. What does that mean? Just because something is <coughs> legal, it doesn't make it ethical. <laughs> Ethics and legality in this country are two separate categories, or two separate things. So you always want to be an act, your acts want to follow into here, both legal and ethical. So you know, it's actually legal to sell your customers information depending upon the concept, uh, uh, co uh, context of receiving it. Is it ethical? Uh, it's also legal to charge sales tax. But what about a state that uh, collects the sales tax? So people legally collect the sales tax, but they don't report it. It's unethical <laughs> to legally accept sales tax from customers online and not give it to keep it. It's profit, right? It's added on to the price. Or shipping costs. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of miscellaneous decisions people make that don't fall into the ethical and the legal category. So it can be unethical and legal. So so as a resource, we also have information technology that falls into the same category. It's computer-based tools that people use to work with uh, information to make it. So hardware, physical devices that make up a computer software, sets of instructions <coughs> for your hardware that executes uh, or carried out. Well, you all know what hardware and software are, I hope. If you don't know what hardware and software are, I don't know if you should be in this class anyway. But <laughs> Information technology, hardware. Well, you might not know everything, but uh, tons of storage devices, CPUs, RAMs, um, software, varieties of different levels of software. This changes constantly. So just because a brand new software package comes out doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't do anything, add value versus the old package. So uh, let's see, in terms of hardware, software. I'm going to kind of skip through this stuff because you guys are a little bit past that. Here's a slide. Uh, not, not a bad one. So we went over the uh, Porter's Five Forces model last time, but that was before the Memorial Day weekend. So I know it's been like two weeks, so you may not remember it, but we did this actually a little bit. 
So the five forces model helps the business people understand the relative attractiveness of an industry and then the industry's competitor pre competitive pressures in terms of buyer power, supplier power, threat of substitute products and services, threat of new entrants, and also rivalry among existing competitors. So this is like de facto standard um, modeling. Uh, it's been around forever. It's almost every business book out there. You'll hear it over and over again, probably in a couple more business classes if you continue to take business classes. Um, but what, what you're looking at, and this is a slightly different representation than I gave you last time. Last time I gave you a chart where it had stuff going up and then stuff going horizontal and vertical, and it was crossing in the middle, showing you how they're at odds with each other. Uh, the theory today is to bring it in with technology and to show how the model actually applies towards different decisions made related to the te management of that technology. Um, so we're looking at the five forces here, and the forces are pretty much working against <coughs> each other. So bargaining power of buyers versus the bargaining power of suppliers. Well, that's an easy one from a business perspective. If you can't get good pricing, you can't sell it for good pricing. <laughs> so, And customers want cheap suppliers want to sell it to you as the highest price possible. So those are definitely at, at odds with each other. The threat of new entrants along with the threat of substitute products or services. Yeah, it would be nice if you were on an island of its own, but you don't want to be on an island of your own. You want to be the best of the other people that are on the same island. <laughs> but how's that going to happen if they keep coming up? It's not going to happen. So, well, you might lose some of it. So rivalry among existing competitors. So buyer power, let's talk about that for a few minutes. Um, higher when the buyers have many choices and low when the choices are few. So think of uh, the real estate market. They use this term a lot. You know, it's a buyer's market. It's a seller's market. I mean, if it's a seller's market, that means the seller's going to get a higher price. So you want to sell when it's a seller's market and buy when it's a buyer's market. And the real estate is actually kind of interesting. It's one of those industries that just goes up and down all the way through the years. So this is a stock market, actually, too. But what's driving the real estate market? Well, people, <laughs> moving, employment, the purchasing power of people. So where are they coming from? Well, from employment. Well, what was that coming from? So from competitors. So it actually is all related. So there's people that predict patterns in the stock market, people that predict patterns in the real estate market based on the price of corn or based on what's going on with the politics or something of that nature, So which is kind of interesting. So competitors' advantages uh, are created to get buyers to stay with a given company as well. Now we've got Netflix here set up and maintain your movie list. Yeah. Um, actually, Netflix turned itself around through many different strategies, and they're still around, which is amazing because I didn't give them this long. As soon as, as, soon as DVDs went out the window, I went, oh, there's not going to be any more Netflix. <laughs> and, then, and then I can't imagine that Redbox would be so popular, but it is, actually. But they're going for a different market. So, But on the Netflix, it's a create your movie list and keep that going. And then United, it's a frequent flyer program, obviously. Apple, iTunes, buy and manage your music. Yeah, for the longest first couple of generations of iTunes, you couldn't get your music out of there. <laughs> so if it's in there, you're going to keep it in there, and you can't access it unless you got one of their products, or at least you're using iTunes. So you're going to keep using iTunes. And Dell is customizing those computer purchases, creating that lab of your, your, your dream lab using the systems you want. So this was buyer power. In terms of the competitive forces, the competitive advantages providing the product or services, in a way that the customer values values more than the competition is able to do. <laughs> if you're able to sell, in fact, which is kind of funny because then you have all these marketing games, sales games, where people will sell at a loss just to burn out their, just to burn out their competition. <laughs> is that ethical? Probably not. But they'll or they'll sell it at cost just to get rid of their competition, and then when the competition has died, they raise their prices. <laughs> And you see, you see that on the internet actually a lot. Uh, and then sometimes it backfires on them. People won't buy it. If something is too cheap, you're not going to buy it. <laughs> Providing a product or service less. Uh, also, first, move, first mover advantage. Significant impact on gaining market share by being the first to the market. So it's like the pet rock. You know, you guys heard of the pet rock? 
You guys aren't Americans, though. The Pet Rocket was, a, was an interesting product. This actually sold millions and millions. It's like the Cabbage Patch dolls, actually. You guys going to Cabbage Patch dolls? Pet Rocks? Chia Pets? These are a ton of useful products on the consumer market in America. The Pet Rock is the one I wanted to actually bring up. You go out to the outside the parking lot here, I, there's some rocks actually in the next to the cars. So you pick one up, splash a coat of paint. Actually, the original didn't have any paint on it. You stick it in a box and you call it Pet Rock and you sell it for like $9.99 or something. And it worked. And like millions of Americans bought these things. And then it wore off. So you're going to come up with Pet Rock number two? Not going to work. <laughs> But they're the first ones who did that. Or the Chia Pet, you grow sprouts through a terracotta pot, and you call it a pet. <laughs> or the Cabbage Patch doll, you, you buy a, I don't know what this thing was made out of. It, it looked like a Cabbage Patch or something. I don't know what it was, but it had a birth certificate. You give a doll a birth certificate and a name, you make it into like a human-like kind of concept. Or, you know, how many people have bought a star? You can buy a star. How many other companies are going to go out and sell stars? Nobody. Who's selling Cabbage Patches? Ain't nobody. And, or there was a, something else, too. Not Cabbage Patch. There was like a, some Beanie Babies. Beanie Bing Bags for like hundreds of dollars for a Beanie Baby. So if you haven't noticed anything with that, all those examples I brought up, there's a name. And there's only one person who's ever, one company who's ever made any money on that. <laughs> Only one pet rock, only one beanie baby. Although a lot of stupid people try to come up with imitation beanie babies, and they call it something else, and they miss the concept. These guys are first movers. You put it out there, you make as much money as you can on it, and then you close your doors. <laughs> it's a fad or whatever. It's not going to be something that people are going to like buy for centuries on it. So, which is kind of interesting. And then you know they always get that fake beanie babies. Uh, the brown babies, or I don't know. They had, they had a couple of cabbage patch imitations out there and stuff like that. They never make as much as the first movers, though. Um, all competitive advantages are fleeting. So all airlines are now providing frequent flyer programs. So on the good ones, you get everybody else who's fleeting, which means you're behind. You're, you're, you're um, what do they call that? Joining the bandwagon. So they stepped on the bandwagon instead of being the first mover. So if you want to be successful, one of the, well, according to Porter, one of the, you know, advantages you have is being a first mover. You know, so IT is actually kind of a first mover in a lot of ways. Uh, supplier power. So supplier power. So high, high when buyers have few choices and low when choices are many. When you have when when the consumer, how many iPods? How many people are selling iPods? Just one. That's really an iPod, which is actually kind of funny because we have fake iPods. We have fake, you know, MP3 players. They're not called iPods, but uh, how many people are selling computers? So compare the kind of product that's on the market with the number of alternative choices that somebody has. Then the supplier power kind of goes down because. You don't have any ply. If you're the only one selling a product, you got a lot of power. If everybody else is selling substitutes or something similar to it that works just as well, then you have a, a PC that you can buy for two hundred dollars. The netbooks is a classic example of that. You can buy any netbook you want for a couple hundred dollars. Well, I don't know if you can still do that, but a while ago when everyone was mass producing these things, you can buy. Now that everyone's mass producing tablets, but yeah, the opposite of buyer power is the uh, supplier power. So. so your suppliers are on one end, your organization's on another, your customers are on another end. These guys aren't competing e with each other in terms of the forces. So you want supplier power to be low here, and you want supplier power to be high over here. <laughs> so you want the buyer power to be high here, and you want the buyer power to be low over here. You don't want the buyer to have any many choices. The more choices they have, the lower your pricing is going to go because they have choices. But you want choices when it comes to your suppliers. So the threat of substitute products and services, which is a definite threat. So high when there are many alternatives for the business and low when there aren't any. So if there's a lot of, if there's a lot of iPads, there's no iPad. Well, it's actually, no one's going to compete with that. <laughs> well, actually, they've tried. They've tried. Uh, but uh, that's a substitute product strategy. 
In fact, there's a lot of companies that just make substitute products <laughs> because the first one out usually, if it's not a first, if, if, the, if it's a first mover and you're producing a high quality product, you're not going to make as much as the second guy who comes in because you spend all the money in the R and D and you spend all the money in the research and it's your product. They're just substitutes, so they're taking it. They're piggybacking on you, which means they're going to be more profitable because. <laughs> They don't have to spend as much time in the research. And they, you're already giving them the idea, essentially. Uh, switching costs. That's another one, too. That it, Cell phone companies use that strategy all the time. Because actually, cellular phone industry, that's a very competitive market. Um, which is actually withstands, actually is a good example for a lot of these different driving forces. So the cost that makes buyers re reluctant to switch to another product or service, yeah, give them the free phone that they're going to pay probably more than the, if they just bought the phone after paying so many months of service on the phone and then giving them a long-term contract. So, great service. So a long-term contract with financial penalty, you know, sell early buyout, whatever, uh, seller penalty, uh, great service, personalized product based on purchase history. So. Mm. Car companies do this a little bit in the service packages. So the threat of new entrants, the threat of new people coming into the market, high when it's an easy for competitors to enter the market, and low when there's entry barriers, entry barriers um, that are significant or kind of impossible to get past. As an example, you're doing a telecommunications product and you don't have access to a telecommunications carrier <laughs> or something, then yeah, it's going to be pretty hard to get in there. Um, it's kind of like producing an iPad or a, a iPhone right now. You don't own iTunes. You're going to make an iTunes? No. You can't make a duplicate product like that. So, and Then entry barriers, a product or service feature for the company has uh, come to expect and you must be offered by an existing organization. Banking, ATMs, online bill pay, entry barrier. So. So the existing competitors and the rivalry among them exists. So high when the competition is fierce and low when competition is complacent, so, obviously. So a lot of this stuff is no-brainer when you think about it. And then when you look at all the mistakes that have been made, you go, well, how, how, how is that? Why did they do it that way? So general trend is towards more competition in almost all industries, which is why a company like Apple will give money to Microsoft to bail them out in hard times. And then... Microsoft will give money to Apple to bail them out, and they've helped each other out, and they're rivalries. They're, they're in competition with each other, but they loan each other money all the time, and they help each other out because they want that. They need that, actually. Um, otherwise, there's no competition. It's no fun. <laughs> so, uh, it also helps the industry. Otherwise, they create an imbalance. So, And IT has certainly uh, intensified competition among different sectors as well. So here's our three generic strategies. So the first model he came out with had five competitive, and these were the five competitive forces that are working against each other or in competition with each other. He also has this model called three generic strategies, where we have the focus strategy, overall cost leadership strategy, or differentiation strategy. So if you're going to produce a product and... Uh, you know, if I if I hired you and said, okay, you know, manage my engineering team, produce a product for us, and you're going to make a tablet or something, or you, I, I, you probably know what you're going to make, because if you're working for this company, they're telling you what you're going to make. Otherwise, if you're deciding, you're having your own company. <laughs> you're not working for somebody else. You're an entrepreneur. Um, so you're going to make something. So you got to figure out what strategy you're going to take. So if you follow this textbook model here for Carter's quarters three strategies. These are generic business strategies for beating the competition, overall cost leadership, maybe some differentiation and maybe some focus in terms of your efforts. So usually you come out and say, well, narrow market scope, broad market scope. Well, say so i got a narrow market scope. Well, then I'm going to focus the focus on strategy. The focus is going to be my strategy. Or, and I'm going to make products that are particular to certain groups in terms of the focus of, of what I'm going to deliver or I can make myself completely different down here on the bottom. So it's, if it's a broad market, there's a lot of people in the market versus there's nobody in the market. If there's nobody in the market, I'm going to make a product that these people need and these people are going to buy it, which is how iTunes kind of came out. There was nothing. Where are you going to buy your music online? 
iTunes. Well, where did that come? What about before iTunes? Get nothing. So that's the focus. And they were making that's a focus strategy because they were making a product that they could sell their other products. So they could sell their other products, which is kind of interesting. If you're making, think about, oh, what was this late 80s, I guess, or mid 80s? I don't know when the iPad came out, but when you bought the first generation of iPad, excuse me, iPod, before the iPhone, before everything else, there's nothing. You couldn't do anything with it. <laughs> and then, uh, well, you had to have a MacBook. It wouldn't work on a PC. But then the, the software was just archaic. It just didn't do anything. Although it was fun, you could play some music on it. That was about it. Didn't have very much memory on it either. So they focused on making the, profit, uh, the product more usable. And to make it more usable, hook it up with iTunes, make iTunes work on a Windows system, make it work on a Mac system. And then they decided, well, a lot of people have Windows systems and they're using them constantly. So then they reformatted them. The original iPods that came out were formatted for the Mac's file system. And you had, it didn't work when you hooked it up to a PC. So then they, now it's actually the other way around. When you buy an iPad out of the box, it comes from Apple, and it's formatted with a <laughs> Windows, <laughs> Windows file system on it. So it works right out of the box with a Windows PC. It's a Mac. I mean, it comes from a Mac company. Anyway, long story short, they focused it on the market. They created services for the product, and then they created better products. So it was a focus strategy. All right, so we have differentiation strategy, and we have overall cost leadership. This is your Walmart over here, your low-cost competition here. So companies like Target, Walmart, um, the ones that strive themselves on being the companies that offer you the lowest cost. Also, the strategy works in other outside of consumer um, markets or outside of grocery stores and stuff like that. I don't know what to call those things. Large, massive consumer stores. <laughs> um, works with, let's say, for example, um, PCs. Works with tablets. Works with concept being, you know, if it's cheaper, people will buy it kind of thing as an alternative. Or differentiation, which is what your high-end people do, like Sony, uh, Apple, um, even Panasonic actually does a little bit of that, where there's nobody that has a retina screen outside of Apple. There's nobody that has high-definition sound like Sony does on some of their TV products. Um, so they're trying to differentiate themselves in terms of the quality of the product and also the features that are available in the product. So if we look at the overall cost to leadership, offering the same product better quality product or services at a price that is less than the comp competition. And that's what I was talking about before. Walmart is a good example of that. Dell, Hyundai, Kia. Actually, there's another company out there as well. Zion, I think. Grocery stores. They're, they're looking at high volume, low margin. You can't do that unless you're reproducing a product, you're copying a product. Hard to do that on a real product. I mean, I shouldn't say real product, but if you're not, if you're a market leader, you can't do that. Only a follower can do that, really. So nobody goes to Walmart because of the brands. <laughs> so differentiation, offering products or services that are perceived as being uh, unique in the marketplace. Now, how many TVs are out there? They're all unique. Uh, Hyundai's. I don't know any of these stores here. Actually, out here, it's uh, Lenardi's, or is it, um, what's that, uh, the Snob Hill? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can pay more for your bread and milk there. Yeah. Focus. Focusing on offering products and services to a particular segment or buyer group. Uh, it goes back to the Apple example I was giving you. Within a segment of the product line and also to a specific demographic or geographic market, which is actually kind of interesting because a lot of the marketing on the Internet was originally focused and it was focused to a demographic that has totally changed throughout the last 20 years. It was focused, well, I don't know what it is now. You can go to U.S. Consensus or who's on the Internet, or I can't remember. I have to go look this up now. But there was a time in which it was 35 to 45 was the age group male. Was the Like 90% of Internet users were fell into that particular demographic. So all of the marketing stuff was for them. Now it's kind of like flip-flopped a little bit. I believe it is still male-dominated, and I believe it's still older, even though all the kids are on Facebook and stuff now. So. But it was like middle-aged or older-aged um, male population, which was the original um, demographic for the Internet. So the focus has got to change if you're going to keep up with the times. 
Example, restaurants, physician offices, legal offices. So that's also the one that's on focus as well. So uh, for the while there, people were so worried about being sued. They had prepaid legal services. They think they still have them, actually, now. But uh, that focus has totally changed. <laughs> people aren't as paranoid anymore. Uh, or, you know, for a while at the time, it was life insurance was the big thing. So people don't care about life insurance anymore either. So you can't really produce those products. So people's consumer focus isn't on that. So now we have another strategy here. So if you don't take those three in terms of Porter's model, we can look at uh, alternatives for frameworks. So top line versus bottom line. And uh, should your strategy focus on reducing costs, which is the bottom line, or increasing revenue, which is the top line. So now you can sound really, uh, really intelligent in your next business meeting. You say, you know what, we got to fix the bottom line. <laughs> What's that? Uh, get better suppliers. <laughs> Reduce our costs somehow. Get rid of this overhead. You know, streamline, the, you know, t turn the air con down, you know. Reduce the bottom line. Or the top line, which is it's always the bottom line for some strange reason. No one ever says, ah, oh, we got to focus on our top line. Nobody focuses on the top line. Okay. I'll go through this in a few minutes with a little better examples. But Or the RGT, sounds like RGB, RGT, Run, Grow, Transform framework. So you allocate in terms of percentages of IT dollars on various different types of business strategies, and you see which one works. <laughs> So you grow, you run it, you grow it, and you transform it. You change it. Oh, this isn't working? Oh, let's just do it that way. So, which is another strategy or a framework, actually. So here's, our, here's a better slide on the top line versus the bottom line. So top line, how do we reach new customers, offer new products, cross-sell services, offer uh, complementary products? Versus optimizing the manufacturing, optimizing the processes, decreasing transportation costs. Mm -hmm. Transportation costs in manufacturing is pretty big. Reduce the cost of human capital layoffs. <laughs> so the bottom line on the bottom line, you're getting laid off if you're working on a bottom line strategy. Top line, eh, people. I think people need to focus a little bit more on the top line actually. So in terms of an income statement, we got the sales versus expenses. <laughs> So if you're a counting person, you can think of it like the top and the bottom. They're supposed to balance. It's supposed to equal. Yeah. Eh. Bottom line is always so big. <laughs> the top line nobody cares about. So if you're taking a top line strategy, then you're going to increase revenue. How do we make more money? Well, we reach new customers. We offer new products. We cross-sell them. We offer them complementary products. If, which, you know, if you think about it, uh, I, uh, Apple sort of tries to do that, you know, like if you, they, 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 their top line is they have this education discount, and when they do the education discount, they sell you a computer for like $100 less, $200 less if you're an educator, or student actually, you go through the Apple store, and then they throw in an iPod annually, like, and they have the same sale in every August, September, or the beginning of the school year, and then they throw in a, some, some, some fun thing. And sometimes people buy it for the throw-in. They go, if I buy this computer, I'm going to get this, you know, outdated iPod Mini that they're trying. I mean, uh, not Mini. Not, that would be great if they threw that in. The Nanos is what I'm talking about. I think they're giving Nanos away now. You know, you, you buy it. Well, I think it was December they did the Nano deal. Because, you know, kids want a music player. They don't, you know, they want an iPod with that. <laughs> so, uh, so throw in something, and you get new customers. You get people that would buy it just because they want the iPod <coughs> or something. So. Well, it's like when you go to the grocery store and you buy a bottle of something and it has something taped to it. I want that one. I always pick that one. I'm not going to pick the one that doesn't have tape to it. Do I really need to buy that one? Probably not. <laughs> I just saw it. It had an extra little thing on there. So that's a new new way to cross. Well, so usually they cross-sell it. They give you a little sample of something and then you try it out. And you go, oh, I like that. They do it with vitamins a lot, too. They put little things inside of it. And you pull it out and go, oh, that's a little sweet little gummy bear thing. Oh, that looks pretty cool. Oh, tastes good. And then you go back and you buy it. So. Bottom line, not so creative, which is, uh, you know, okay, you have to be creative to do a top line strategy. You got to think of all this stuff. You got to be very creative. Uh, the bottom line, you don't have to be very creative. You just have to be very um, minimalist. How can we get five people to do the job that ten people used to do? And how do we reduce our costs? So you minimize the expenses, optimize manufacturing, decrease transportation costs, minimize errors in the process. So.
So, the run, grow, transform. How do you allocate IT dollars? So you run, you optimize the ex execution of existing processes. So you spend your IT dollars and your money, given that you're doing a top line. See, the top line you're spending money, the bottom line you're saving money. <laughs> so you're going to do a top line on this. Well, you could actually fall into the bottom line if you're optimizing and then getting rid of people to reduce your cost, which is like a lot of people do. If you fix accounting programs, you fix HR programs, you fix the customer service programs, you don't need as many people working on them. <laughs> get it so the technology is helping them do a better job, and then you get rid of the excess you don't need, and then it saves you money. So you, in your running business, you put IT dollars towards the equipment of the running of the business and the things that you would normally put on for existing processes. You increase the market share of the products and the service offerings by growing it and then you transform so you have innovative business processes products and services that come out of it it's a different strategy actually so, so we have a porter's a uh, top line bottom line and uh, run grow train uh, kind of transformation here the run is the overall cost leadership equals bottom line so if you're if you're working with the run strategy you're decreasing your bottom line and you have uh, overall cost leadership is what you're striving for. You want to reduce your cost somehow. The grow is to focus on differentiation, which is the top line. So all these concepts actually work together. Uh, and the transform is the new differentiation. You're transforming your business. You're becoming a content provider instead of a service provider or something. Uh, and that's a top line strategy because you're getting new customers and new, new things, and the focus is on innovation instead. So. Mixed in with all this, we have this value chain analysis. So I'm sort of switching gears a little bit instead of talking about all the different strategic approaches in terms of what they are. And this is generic stuff. So if you take an entrepreneurial management course, then you get the non-generic stuff. <laughs> Fortunately for you, if you get in the area of engineering management or technology management, it's usually all generic. It's the entrepreneurs and it's the non-traditional type of manager that will go into those other strategies that are kind of some touch and go. These are solid, worked through times and seem to repeat themselves over and over again in terms of companies. So value chain analysis. So thinking of everything as a value chain, <laughs> creating a value chain, supply chain value chain, customer value chain, sales value chain, marketing value chain, manufacturing value chain. There's value chain for everything. So value chain analysis is a systematic approach to assessing and improving the value of the business processes. So a lot of this is probably one of the most misunderstood concepts. Everyone says, oh, it's the supplier value chain, supply chain value chain, or it's the well, supply chain itself is a value chain. But it's the CRM, it's a customer management value chain or something. All right, so if you uh, walk into one of these companies and you go into the operations department, <laughs> you see value change. So usually in the old days, I don't know if they're still doing this, in the old days you used to have these huge whiteboards, you know, that take up the whole wall. Or they put cork on there. And they print out these huge little, it looks like a flow chart. It goes all the way around the room. And that's showing you, and it's usually labeled value chain. <laughs> so it's the customer service value chain, or it's the... R&D value chain or something. Anyway, long, long story short, it's showing the no-brainer on how things are supposed to work and the overall strategy of what you're doing, how you're transforming making the product or how you're transforming and creating the customer, getting the customer. So it's um, hard to see it um, in the form of words. So it's a very graphical thing. So it's, that's why you always see like the big old charts and things. There's actual software programs that do value chain analysis for you. <laughs> And the analysis part is, how do you put the different things together? So if you like operations management, you like value chain. Operations management is nothing more than assemble. I shouldn't say that. I'm, I'm trivializing it, but trivializing it. But nothing more than taking different things and ways of doing stuff and rearranging the order. So, no, we want this department to do this, and we want that department to do that, and this one's going to do this. And you divide everything out, and then you have, from an operational perspective, you see how well it runs, and then you tweak it to make the machine run better. It's kind of like how you uh, can place um, different items 
Well, if you're an engineer, it's how you place different items on a board <laughs> to minimize the heat, uh, minimize or you know minimize the connection length between components to get the better, stronger signal. Get rid of interference. Sometimes it's with the layering. Sometimes it's with you know how many layers you're going to do. What kind of board layout you're going to do. That's the type of person who likes value chains <laughs> because it's really an analysis of how you're going to put the pieces together. It's like puzzles. So. In terms of the value chain, and some things are possible, some things aren't possible. Uh, so the analysis is the approach for assessing and improving the value chain. The value chain itself is a series of business processes, if you want a good definition for this, each of which adds value to your organizational product or services. So it's a bunch of processes. And then the business process itself is what people are doing. It's the task. So every company's got different business processes. And so they have... Um, standardization of a set of processes to accomplish this task and then we have this thing called Taylorism it's not on the slide but it, if I were to add another slide to this I'd put in here the Taylorism strategy which is kind of a military-ish strategy that says find the way the best way to do a job standardize it train the people to do the job correctly support it with IT and IS and then take the blame away from the person who's doing the job and move it up one level in management. <laughs> so Taylorism works in like a Target store as an example or like um, a Walmart. Mass, where you have a lot of employees and they're all ringing up sales. Or you have a bunch of customer service people and they're all answering the phone. Everybody's supposed to answer it the same way. Everyone goes through the same routine. The job is standardized. You bring up a screen, you, you do this, you do that, you do this, and you do it under two minutes. <laughs> you have all these things that you're supposed to do, and you're like a robot. And then if something goes wrong, the, the department numbers aren't right, it's no longer, your, it's no longer their responsibility. They're, as long as you're doing your job correctly, it's the man, it, you shift the blame up a level. So the department manager's got the issue now. And then the department manager goes in and says, okay, you know what, you sit over there and you sit over here. <laughs> and uh, we're going to reroute the calls so they go this way. Well, now we've got a front line, now we've got a back line. And the manager goes in and reorganizes everything and then to see how the team's doing. So it really isn't the team, and it's a terrible way of putting it, but it really isn't any individual contributor. It's the team that's doing it. So that's Taylorism, which is the military. You know, they have different levels, hierarchies. They have different jobs and different things, and it's all a hierarchical kind of structure with, well, not managers, you have officers and stuff, but it's approach, it's the similar, very similar approach, but you apply it towards business, and it works great with uh, information systems and technology, because, you know, if you give them a scanner, they scan it this way. <laughs> you give them a computer program, they use it a certain way, everything gets logged correctly, hopefully, so... We have two types of processes. We have primary and support processes that are considered. And we put those in there as well. Um, they're very similar. Primary support depends upon whether or not you're working as a team or whether you're working solo in terms of what it is you're trying to get. So, All right, so most people look at the value chain sort of graphically. So here's a picture of a value chain. So we have the support value processes over here, and we have the primary value processes over here, which is our two levels of processes. And if you break them out into support and primary, you can kind of kind of see where I'm going with on here. Primary, inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing, sales, service. These are all towards the business goal. These are all these are all jobs that are going to be um, towards the product or support value. Uh, it means a, in, a firm infrastructure, you know, um, human resource management, technology development, procurement. So usually information systems department, information technology falls in here, which is actually kind of interesting. In the old days, when you had to, you were a business and you weren't making any money, and you had to get rid of something, you got rid of the support. There were supports the first departments to go. So if you want job security, you don't work in support. <laughs> you work in primary. Primary is down here. So you're doing something that's going to lead to the product distribution or the product sale or the product manufacture. They don't get rid of manufacturing people. They don't get rid of sales or operations <coughs> people. You can't afford to. Can you get rid of an HR manager? Sure. Why not? 
Unfortunately, HR is the first department that gets downsized. They used to downsize information systems and information technology, but then they realized, well, that's really not, not so much of a support anymore. It's if you're driving your business with technology, it's a, it's a primary value to the company. It's not a support value, which means the company's going to need that. And uh, that's evident with what happened with a lot of the financial companies. So the really big financial investment brokers that all went broke, you know, they did not invest at all in any of the consumer products we have today where you can go online and manage your portfolio and, you know, uh, buy and sell stocks and do stuff as a consumer. You can actually see things online. Well, those are all, every company does that, right? Well, what if you're one of those big companies, you're losing money, you get rid of all your IT people. <laughs> and then when the market recovers, you need that service, but you don't have that service because you didn't spend any money on that service. So you still have to spend money when you're losing money in order to make money further down the road, So, which is kind of ironic. It takes money to make money. <laughs> and if you don't have money, you can't spend money, but that's when you need to spend money. <laughs> so and it's kind of like life, actually, if you think about it, not to bring up college or anything, but those people who have to pay tuition can't afford to pay the tuition. And then when you can afford to pay the tuition, you don't want to pay the tuition. You don't have to pay the tuition. You already got a good job. So, which is kind of like, you know, okay, great. So, I think that's why people default on student loans all the time. I don't know. <laughs> Costs you too much, but it's worth it in the end. You have to spend money to make money. So, yeah, for traditional education. All right, so value chain analysis here, we have the primary, we have the support. Uh, the primary, just give you a few more pieces of information on this, takes in raw materials and makes, delivers, <clears throat> markets, and sells the service. I always think if it's, a, if it's going towards the goal of the product or the service that the company is delivering, it's primary. If it's an extra on top of that, just support the company in general, then it's a secondary or a value. There's a support value. So it supports the primary value process. Ask customers which processes add value and which processes reduce value. Yeah. Interesting question. A lot of people would say it's the support. <laughs> if you're the employee and you're working for the company, it's really the support value that you're looking for because you want that HR department before they throw it out the window. So in terms of the percentage operations, 40% in terms of value-added processes. This is how many jobs are there in the company? What percentage of the company efforts and spending goes in each one of these different um, functions or you know, part pieces of the value chain? Lots and operations. So you're going to end up spending a lot in operations. Logistics, inbound, procurement, pretty high as well. Uh, we're looking at a pretty big value-added process. Hey, human resource, 7.1. Firm infrastructure, 3.1. This is like the maintenance people, uh, the garbage, the, the excuse me, janitorial service, the kind of front desk people. Well, I shouldn't say front desk. Um, I don't know. Technology development is pretty low too, which is kind of kind of sad. Value reducing processes, and this is value adding, value added processes. So to add value, to reduce, we're looking at uh, marketing and sales. 36% for reducing. Mm. Uh, that's the biggest category in this. Outbound logistics. So. So. Anyway, that's a kind of a brief kind of overview of, um, and it, it actually kind of concludes the part, Porter's model that I gave you last time I started with. And I believe I finished that last lecture, did I not? From right before the break? Did I? I have time. So we'll go a little bit longer because, you know what, believe it or not, I, I, okay, so when I originally started out the lecture, I started saying, well, I took some allergies. I, I think it's the caffeine and the Diet Coke is helping me go. So we'll go a little bit longer, unless you guys want to end up coming out early today. You guys want more or less? Wait, if I ask that, you're going to say no. <laughs> originally, when I started out this lecture, I said I was only going to go till about 3.30 because I was suffering from allergy and I took some stuff that made me sleepy, but now I'm like energetic again. <laughs> I'm going like this. <laughs> I can either stop, I gotta go now if I'm gonna go, otherwise I gotta stop. <laughs> I'm in between lectures. Okay, we'll just give you a break because you're not gonna answer. All right, so we'll get out a little bit early today, but 
yeah, we're good. We're good. In terms of material, we're good. Um, I have a few minutes so I can go over. I have a, a lot of people actually um, sent me emails about the assignments because you were bored. Uh, not bored. You were busy and then you decided to do some schoolwork. Um, so if you want, if you're not sure about an assignment, you can email me the assignment as a file attachment. I can look at it and tell you whether or not it's good or whether or not you've done what I wanted you to do. You don't have to, though. It's not required. You can just upload it into the EMS. I didn't put any due dates on any of the assignments, um, but everything is due on August 22nd. I already went over the first assignment, and uh, I can go over the second. We also have case studies in here as well, not to... Uh, we have assignments, and then we have case studies. So most people usually start with the assignments, and then they go over the case, then they do the case studies next. But... Um, Let's take a look at the case study instructions, actually, because I haven't gone over those yet. And then uh, I'll show you where the case studies are. So case study number one instructions, and then the case study. The case study itself is reproduced out of a book. And it is out of a Computing with Information Technology. It's a Dell, Dell, Intel, and others competitive advantage of information technology. So it's very information technology focused. And there's questions at the end of it. It says one, two, three. And the questions are interesting. It says, do you agree with the argument made by uh, Nick Carr? Hmm. And the other one, do you agree with the argument made by the business leaders? And then uh, what are several ways that IT could provide competitive advantages to a business? Which fits in line, actually. The case studies are, are kind of kind of interesting. But uh, for some people who, uh, especially if you come from the science background, you don't normally like this wording. It says, do you agree? Uh, what, what page is that information on? What, 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 what resource do I look for this? It's like, it's supposed to be right here. <laughs> it's your opinion. So there's really, okay, so business people like it because there's really no right or wrong answer. And then you get to say everything you ever wanted to say about something and no one's going to stop you. So, and you don't have to agree. You can totally disagree. And that's okay. <laughs> In fact, on a couple of them, I actually sort of disagree. Uh, but if I go over the instructions, let me do that real quick here. Probably should have separated this out into a separate video, but it's okay. Anyone watching this can stop the video at this point. It is merely for assignment description. <coughs> All right, so the case is on GE, Dell, Intel, and others, and competitive advantages of information technology. Read the case. Answer the questions. Uh, the questions should be typed and not handwritten, so do them on a word processor. Number each one of the answers, but you don't have to repeat the question. So just go one, two, three. Provide your own insights and perspectives on these analysis. So if it says, do you agree, I'm not expecting something that's cut and pasted from the Internet. How could someone anonymously on the Internet agree with you? Or, <laughs> It's not a research assignment. There's no internet needed. Just connect your internet connection and think about this is going to be, you know, I say this now, but let's just see what happens at the end of the term. <laughs> don't space it. Use a 12 point. I don't care what font you use. Just don't write it like extremely big. You know, use something normal you know, because it's on page length. So your submission should be not less than two pages in length. Plus your complete assignment, case study to the EMS entry for the class. But you can show me your case study if you want. I can say, you know, are your thoughts, I'm not going to judge your thoughts on whether or not you agree. So you can do them um, separately. However, don't do all the cases together. You do each one of them separately and turn each one of them separately. It should just be one file. There's no support files that go along with it unless you want there to be one. Just the amount of information given in that one. That's a good question. So uh, these are real life cases from real life companies. You do not you do not have to research these companies. So base your answers off of the information that's in the case. So it's your opportunity to BS as much as you want. It's not really BS, I guess. It is. You can think of it like a BS opportunity if you want to. That's bachelor's of science. Just kidding. <laughs> um, it can be. Uh, don't go out and research. These companies don't go out and, you know, figure out. And actually, some of them have changed. If you know something about the company, you can use that knowledge in your answer. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was your question? 
Oh. Yeah, if you know something about, and there's actually there's a lot of things about Dell and about Intel and about GE that you might know of or heard of or read in the news, you can use that. You're not stuck with just the content of the case, especially if you know the follow-up to some of these, because these are actually a bit dated. They're a couple years, they're about four years old, I think. So they uh, may have changed situations, and you may have seen some of the answers actually play out, and you may, if you do, you can write about that. So if you don't, don't worry about it. You can and just you base it off of that. You don't have to reference anything. If you're using outside resources and you're actually integrating the research into the writing, reference it. If you're not going to write direct quotes or paraphrase, well, even if you're paraphrasing, it's okay. But if you're going to write direct quotes in there, and I highly recommend that you actually use quotation marks in there, because turn it in will might actually be implemented by the end of the term, and so that'll catch it, and it'll say, "Oh, you plagiarized it," you know, come up and show you something. Then use a reference citation, and then it doesn't get caught as plagiarism. It gets caught as a reference, like it's supposed to be. So um, it doesn't have to be in the APA or the MLA or the whatever format. It can be in any format that you want. And you're simply not writing it like a traditional business school. Um, I don't know if they even – does anyone do that here at ITU, business school case studies? No? In business school, if you get an MBA, <laughs> normally have – introduction and you have it's it's a special format they call a case study format that each business school comes up with and it has like a format you're supposed to do it's called a case study format this is not this is a answer three question format <laughs> this is not case study format so they do that because in all these case studies they can compare them across and they're all consistent among all the students and then they archive them so I don't know. well there's different reasons for it as well the assignments, you want to use an APA format. Yeah. Yeah, page count and everything. Yeah. So the second assignment here, uh, I gave you the first one. The second one, yeah, oops, let me just open up a new tab here. So, so that was a case study. Are there any questions on the case studies? They're all done the same way, they're just different topics. And there's an instruction sheet for each one of them, but it's all the same. <laughs> it's just the name of the case that's changed. Okay, so for the second assignment, because you don't really want to wait until the last day of the class to work on this stuff. So the second assignment is actually not too bad. It is answering more questions. <laughs> What are you answering? The theme is slightly different. So you explain the impact of engineering management. Okay, so if you haven't figured it out already, engineering management as a concept is extremely broad. It takes technology management, information systems, information technology. Um, I know there's no such thing as engineering if you think about it. It's like everything's an engineer. So it's a lot of different topics all put together. So what you're doing in this assignment is actually kind of focusing on what well, it makes it engineering, engineering management. So explain the impact of engineering management, information systems, and technology in the area of police information systems. Hmm. So you need to do some research. This one will require some research. So you're going to do some internet research to understand how the police are currently using information systems and technologies. I will tell you one thing in general. About two years ago, the San Jose Police Department did a major upgrade. So did the county transit system, and they're using a very similar system now. So think of the emergency response. Do you know that you can actually text message 911 now? <laughs> All right, hint, hint. Go out there and see if you can explore and find out. That's more, that's more than just that. Um, the different things that the police system has done. When it says police system, you can extend that out, make it broader in terms of public services. So if you can't find anything, don't like the police system, I hate the police, you know, I don't want to work with the police system, and you want to work with something else, then as long as it's closely related. As an example, some people in here take the bus, and you may not have realized, but the county transit system actually had an extremely advanced upgrade about two or three years ago as well. Actually, everything happened about two or three years ago, where they know exactly where their buses are, their GPS tracked. 
so they know when the buses are running late. In fact, you can on your phone, you can figure out when the buses are coming. And it's all integrated into Google. Actually, when you get your maps as well, it knows if it's the buses on time, stuff like that, which is actually kind of cool. Um, so you can talk about that if you want to. If you don't like the police system, you can talk about public county transit or a private transit system. Think about a public service. Um, the health, it's kind of a stretch, but you can look at health care if you want to. But there should be enough in police or enough in transit. Emergency response system isn't really a police system, but it's, it would fall into that category as well. You can talk about the emergency response. Country-specific. I'm sorry? Country-specific. Country-specific? Wow, that's an interesting question. It doesn't necessarily have to be U.S. It doesn't have to be U.S. Well, that's what I was trying to say. It can be any public service kind of thing. For Think about for servicing large quantities of people. Say that one more time. Mumbai Dabbawala, that's like a chain of people who deliver lunch in Mumbai. Oh. Yeah, it's very famous. Okay, you can do that. <laughs> public service or servicing the public or servicing large, something significant in size, where the concept, okay, so you talk about the police information system as an example. What characterizes that as unique is the fact that it's offering services to everybody in the county. And it's not something they're paying for, so they're not working with the same type of market. They're not buying police services, nor are you buying county transit. You are sort of paying a ticket, so. The lunches, you're probably buying the lunch, it's just fine. But the concept being it's servicing people and using information to help you better process those people and better help those people. So. It has to do with the exposure to the impact of consumer management or IT. Yeah. I'm not sure. From a perspective, you're explaining the impact of the management of the engineering processes is what's meant by the... Into business management. It borderlines because you have information systems and technology. You could talk about the business management aspect of the service. Let's take police service as an example. But focus more on the technology. So, if you, I mean, you could take business management to an extreme and talk about marketing or talk about accounting or human resources or something. But I want you to focus more on the technology, actually. So it's technology management, sort of? Yeah. All right. It's only 100 to 250 words, so it's not, not, not a novel either. But it might require some exploration. So the second question, what are the functions and disadvantages of information technology used in engineering management? That's kind of a hard question. Because at this point, then you have to understand, well, what, what are we talking about in terms of this engineering management thing? Hopefully by the end of the course, you'll know what course you're taking. <laughs> but at this point, you might be concerned and it's like, well, information technology used in engineering management. So if you want a couple of different examples of what engineering managers are, an engineering manager would be the guy who's hired to manage the research people. It would be the guy who's hired to manage, and it, the word manage has to be in the, your sort of definition in terms of what you're looking at. It's not a research scientist. It's the guys who are managing the research scientists. Or if it's a telecom, your at and it's the guys who manage the guys who are working on the telecommunication hubs. Or if you're pg and &E, it's the guy who's managing the workers who are fixing the lines, who are installing new service, who are doing everything. So it's technology management slash information technology slash engineering slash, there's a couple of different components with that. But it's getting the tech, it's, it's more technology oriented than general management because you have to understand the technology part of it and it's very industry specific. An engineering manager for an electronics firm is going to have a totally different job than the guy working at PG&E. <laughs> is he doing engineering management? Yeah, he's, he's managing people that are working with engineering concepts or engineering manufacturing or engineering of some sort. So engineering, what do we, we make electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, we have different kind of breeds of engineering. The people that go out and fix the bridge, the Dumbarton Bridge or the a Golden Gate Bridge, those are engineers. The engineering manager is the guy who's managing the people who are fixing the bridge. 
And then we have the, you know, the, you know, the IC chip people. People are making Intel chips and things of that nature, or other chips in general. PC board manufacturers, PCB houses, managers that manage. So the managers is working, could be working with technology depending upon the job, could be managing the people, uh, could be applying the technology, or coming up with new ways of applying the technology for different products and services. We also have product and service companies where we have engineer management. So, you know, actually making an iPod. The guy who manages <laughs> the iPod manufacturer, he's an engineering manager. Or actually, there's many. There's industrial design managers, actually, who, who work with the design part of it. There's manufacturing managers that work with the manufacturing. There are manufacturing manager, design manager, industrial design manager, operations manager, those all subparts of engineering managers. What's not an HR manager is not. <laughs> um, rarely are you going to find a marketing and sales guy who would be engineering manager. Uh, yeah, but a majority of them, there's kind of a crossover. All right, so the next question here. <laughs> so how does technology influence the organizational's goal? Ugh, that's a tough one. What are some, yeah? Excuse me? These questions are not They're not correlated. They're totally separate questions, off, way off in different tangents. Uh, what are uh, the features contributing to the success and failures of engineering management plans and strategies? That you get out of the strategy lecture I just gave you. So the first three assignments actually correlate with the material that I'm giving you. <laughs> this is what we're on now. We're on assignment number two now in terms of the content. We just started. So next week's lecture, we'll continue with more information from this that will be applied towards this. Explaining and using uh, the use of utility of artificial intelligence. We haven't hit that yet. We've talked about business intelligence, business knowledge, knowledge but we have, artificial, we have AI coming up in a couple lectures coming up. Um, so you can start working on this one. You don't have to take your information from the lectures. You can take it from the internet. As long as you're writing it yourself, you can do your own research. You may also find a book that you like on the topic. So, And as I mentioned before, there is no book for this course because I can't find one book that's going to have everything in that. And we only have like one or two, you know, engineering management. And they're, they're cited. They're not like giving you the broad concepts. Questions on assignment number two? Or the case study. Well, if you I do have questions, you can always email me. So, start working on this stuff. And my, some of it's actually kind of fun. And then uh, make sure you turn it all in before the end of the semester, though. So, so if we don't have any questions, as promised, I am going to let you out early. <laughs> it is 3:30. We're a half hour or so early. So, I am done for today. I will see you next week. <laughs>